Okay. Uh, so, good morning to all of you. Uh, till now, you heard the basics of plasma. You learnt what plasma is in a, in a small way. You also learnt that there are different applications of plasma. And you also learnt that uh, plasma can have various, various temperatures. Now, one of the applications of plasma at high temperatures is what I am going to talk about. And this, as I go through the talk, my effort is to make you realize as to why this is important. I will not go into the details of the technical details of the talk because uh, I see that there are a lot of kids and they probably will not be able to digest that. But my, my aim is to generate enough interest in you all to at least have an idea of this mega project that India is participating in and probably at a very, in a very simple way or in a very cheap way, we will be able to access technologies of future which will be beneficial not only for us but for the generations to come. So with these introductory words, I take you through the journey of ETA project and the overviews and challenges. So uh, what is ITER all about? In a simple way, if we look at, ITER is a unique mega science and an engineering experiment. Now there are two important words, mega science because it involves a lot of technologies and it involves a lot of physics and the various branches of science. And similarly, mega engineering because the components that we talk about here are mega in size. You are talking of components in meters instead of small components that you see around and you are talking of components which are very heavy. For example, uh, a machine which has components weighing as much as 10 times the weight of one plane, one single plane. So there is one component in this machine which is called the cryostat. Its weight is about 10 times the weight of one single plane. So, uh, so, that, is, so that is why it is mega. Now, what does it demonstrate? It is for demonstrating a virtually limitless, there are three, uh, safe and environmentally friendly. So, limitless means there are no limits. If it is successful, you can produce energy for years. Safe in the sense because if you use conventional energy sources, for example, if you are burning coal, there is a lot of carbon dioxide produced. And that carbon dioxide is not good for you and the generations in future. This is a, a, a technique to demonstrate the same production of electricity or energy, but in a way where there are no carbon dioxide emissions at all. So you have made it safe and you have made it environment friendly also. I also call it safe because the reaction is very contained. It switches off as soon as the fuel is off. For example, I do not know how many of you. But if you have heard of, a, of nuclear accidents, for example, the recent one was in Fukushima, Japan. You saw that the reaction turned off, but the byproducts, they spread uh, radiation all around and that affected many lives. But in this case, if you are talking of fu fusion instead of fission, it is much more controlled. So there is not a lot of radiative damage to the surroundings. So that is why it is safe as well. So we are talking of a unique mega science and engineering experiment to demonstrate a limitless, safe and environment source of energy from hydrogen isotopes and through a process which is called fusion. Now, of course, it is one of the biggest challenges of civilization. Why is it big? Biggest challenges because it involves three aspects. One is it involves very uh, complicated aspects of science. It involves very complicated aspects of engineering in terms of a small human man building components which are meters in size with a very good precision, but uh, it has to work. And the third thing is that this kind of project involves many countries. So you have different cultures, you have different mindsets, you have people from different countries having different ways of working. And all of them have to work coherently to make the machine to work. So that is why this experiment is technically termed as a biggest challenge for our civilization. Now, with this introduction, let us see why do we want to pursue the path of fusion energy and how did ITER start? 
And how did India start, start participating in ITER? So let us look at this. He told you about the uh, present day sources of energy. We use a lot of coal, we use a lot of wood, we use a lot of oil, we use a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy sources to a certain extent. And we also use a small amount of nuclear uh, power through nuclear plants, through nuclear fission. Okay? Now, as the years are rolling by, in fact, uh, I was looking at some graphs yesterday, and what I came to know was that we and the children and our children are, look, are staying in a golden age where the output from each of these sources that we are using at present is at its peak. After that, it is going to fall. So if it is going to fall, what it means is that the amount of energy or the power available per person or the per capita available per, uh, power is going to decrease over the years. So we are going from, an, we started with an age of camel, as Ravi showed in the previous slide, and we will end up in the age of camel if we do not act today. So that is why we need to constantly renew or uh, you know, keep thinking about how to manage the whole uh, energy scenario in such a way that our generations of future also start to uh, enjoy the same benefits that we are doing today or in fact do better than us. Now, this is, a, this is a study which was carried out in Nagpur because it is done in an Indian scenario, so I, so I present it here, but it's very interesting. So what is it showing? It is showing that we, are, we were using 59% of coal, we were using hydroelectricity to 17%, we were using renewable energy sources in, of 12%, natural gas of 9%, nuclear of 2%, and oil of 1%. Now, if we are burning so much of coal, there is a lot of carbon dioxide emission which is coming out. And we have already starting seeing the, started seeing the effects in terms of our environment. So what does it first say? It first says that we have to burn less and less of coal so that our environment goes friendly. So there's, here's a projection done by this guy who, who did this study that in 2030, we would have readjusted our sources that from 59% coal, we will be using only 23%. Okay? But we will depend more on the natural gas, we will depend more on the oil, the nuclear or the electric power will increase to 8%, okay? and the renewable energy sources will also rise by 1%. And the other important thing is, it shows that out of this range of energy sources which are available, how much does each industry utilize that source? For example, transportation, it uses 87% of its total consumption from the oil. And it uses only 10% from the other sources, which is the renewable energy source, and part of it from the natural gas. But however, if we go to residential, we are using more of natural gas. 78% natural gas, 15% from oil, and 6% from the renewable energy sources, and then some of it from the coal. So this is how the distribution from the different sectors which use energy varies as we go from one sector to another. But the important thing to take home from this from this slide is that over the years, our present available energy sources and the renewable energy sources are going to decrease over the time. And the wind and the solar that we depend upon, actually it is environment depend dependent also. For example, if there is no sun for a few days, then we are gone. Or if there's not enough wind, then the tunnels don't, the wind wheels don't rotate and we don't have power. So they, they do help in, help in the stuff, but to a certain limits. So that is why we need to find out an alternate energy source. Now, how did this thought come about? This thought came about from the fusion in the universe. And the biggest example of that is sun. So what is, and the stars as well. So in a, what, what happens in a fusion reaction? In a fusion reaction, you have two light nuclei, let us say two hydrogen atoms, okay, in the state of a plasma, so two hydrogen ions. Now two hydrogen ions, because of the same charge, what do this? ions in the same charge do, they repel each other. They, they don't allow to come near and near. But you have to make them to fuse. Fuse means you have to make them to come together. Now how do you make them to come together? You have to apply some force from outside. Now in the case of a sun, sun is about 300 times the mass of the earth. So there are strong gravitational forces in the sun. And these strong gravitational forces make the two atoms to fuse together and that is how the nuclear fusion happens in the sun. Now, this is a continuous ongoing process in the sun. And so we thought, okay, why not we replicate a sun's process on the earth? In simple words, if you listen to many of the nuclear fusion talks, they always keep saying, 
oh, we want to bring the sun on the earth. Now, do we really bring sun on the earth? It's not. It's not what we are bringing sun on the earth. We are trying to replicate the processes which are happening in the sun to, in some way, on the earth. That is what bringing the sun to the earth means. So, what, there are many uh, ways in which fusion has been tried. One of the most promising ways is through this machine which is called the tokamak. Tokamak is basically, so, sorry, the tokamak is basically a Russian word which means a toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. So, it's like a toroidal chamber is a torus, torus is like a vada or a donut and in that you have a lot of magnetic fields and you use these magnetic fields to confine the whole thing. So, we are trying to bring the sun on earth in a machine which is called tokamak. Now, let us talk about the fusion on the earth. So, uh, what we do is, first of all, just to give you an idea, if we use 1 gram of fusion fuel, we are actually producing energy equivalent to 8 tons of oil. So, compare the, the, the one is in grams, the other is in tons. Okay? The second thing is that we are using isotopes of, uh, isotopes of hydrogen. So, isotope, can somebody say what isotope means? Okay. No. So, isotope is nothing but you take a basic hydrogen atom which has one proton and one neutron. When you go on adding neutrons to the stuff, it becomes heavier and heavier. That, are, that is called the isotope. So, the two isotopes of hydrogen that we use here are the deuterium and the tritium. Okay. They are, they are hydrogen atoms with more number of neutrons in them. So, you have, you have uh, 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 a deuterium atom and a tritium atom and the two atoms are made to fuse together. Now, when you fuse, then the new product that is formed has a different mass. And because of this mass difference, there comes the famous Einstein equation which is delta E is equal to delta mc square. Delta m is basically the difference in the mass between the reactants and the products. And so, what is happening is this difference in the mass is getting converted into energy. And that is the energy we talk about. So, here for example, you will see that you have a deuterium and a, a tritium which fuse together and they produce a helium. And the difference in the mass is coming out as 3.5 MeV. And the byproduct is also a neutron which has an energy of 14 MeV. Both these energies have a role to play. As I go ahead, I will tell you more about it. But for the moment, let us understand that if, if we are trying something in a machine called tokamak, this is the reaction what we are trying. We are trying to fuse deuterium and tritium together. We, and what we get as a byproduct, we get helium atoms at 3.5 MeV and we get neutrons at 14 MeV. Okay. So, uh, once you have produced that, once you have produced that, you have produced a hot plasma, which is shaped and confined by strong magnetic fields. And the neutrons uh, and the heliums are the byproducts. So, in a fusion power plant, a conventional steam generator, turbine and alternator will transform the heat into electricity. Now, where does this heat come from? This heat comes from the neutrons. Okay? And what does the helium nuclei do? The helium nuclei with this 3.5 MeV, it transfers its energy to the plasma itself. Okay? So, it helps you increasing the temperature of the plasma, which is required for the, uh, to reach the fusion temperatures. So, this is where the plasma becomes self-sustaining. Initially, you use auxiliary heating devices to increase the temperature of the plasma. Then as the deuterium and uh, tritium uh, fuse, they are producing helium which has energy of 3.5 MeV. This 3.5 MeV is you know, use, utilized to increase the temperature of the plasma further and further. So, your auxiliary heat power from the auxiliary heating devices is reducing, but your fusion power is increasing. So, that this is where you are transiting from auxiliary heating devices to self-sustainable plasma at a higher temperature. So, this is the role the helium nuclei sustain the burning plasma. This is what it, it means. And what do the neutrons do? The neutrons have a, a go and hit a blanket and uh, the blanket then helps you produce the biofuel which is called the tritium. So, you have a lithium blanket like Lavi was mentioning about the lithium batteries that you are using. So, you have a lithium blanket and these 14 MeV neutrons, they go and hit the blanket and they convert it into tritium. The tritium is then a self-sustainable fuel in the, uh, in the thing itself and the 14 MeV is heating up this blanket. 
So if all this heat, you were able to heat up the water with that and take it out as energy, then that can be used to run the turbines and you have electricity out of it. So these are the concepts which are being used in the tokamaks to demonstrate or to bring sun on earth and utilize this fusion as an alternate source of energy for the future generation. So this is the basis behind it. Now, so what, if we, we were to summarize what we learned till now, we say that we, have, we are trying to develop a new source of energy which is good for the environment. It is safe. The fuel is abundant because deuterium comes from the seawater and, lith and lithium, you are, tritium you are generating from the blanket itself and it has been proven in the laboratory. How it has been proven or why it has not become uh, economically viable till now is for a reason. Although it has been demonstrated in the laboratory, but there is a reason why it has not become commercially available for the moment. So I will come to that later. Now there is a, there's a constant progress. So right from let us say 50s, we have that, that was the time when the first tokamaks were built. And slowly the size of the, um, uh, as the understanding of the plasma increased, as the more and more physics modeling and calculations went over, people started to realize that we need to confine plasma more and more because this plasma always has this tendency to get lost to the walls and heat up the walls. And so you don't want all that. You want the plasma to remain. So how do we, what are the different processes which disrupt the plasma? So all these studies have gone on for 70 years. And uh, you can see that there are different machines which have been built around the world. These are the different machines. And what it says is that over the period, the amount of time for which you can uh, sustain the plasma has increased. Okay? If we were to, this is, this is, these are the theoretical calculations. These are the experimentally observed numbers. And you can see that there is a steady straight line increase in this thing. So if we were to go to ITER, we are talking about 3.6 seconds. Why is this 3.6 seconds? What is it telling you? It is telling you that if, the few, if there was some disruption reaction inside this or if the fuel goes away, then you can still have the plasma for 3 seconds and after that it will switch off. So this is where we say that plasma, this nuclear fusion is more safe because as soon as the source switches off, within a few seconds the reaction itself switches off and so it becomes safe for the environment if there is any accident. So this is what it is and this is a toroidal chamber where you produce magnetic field in this uh, uh, using these coils. The magnetic field is going in this direction and it is helping you confine the plasma. Now, I was talking about the DT fusion being demonstrated in the labs. As the years progressed by, there were two labs in the world. One is Jet Lab Joint European Taurus Experiment, which is in UK. And there is another lab which is called TFTR, which is in US. Both these labs demonstrated ex fusion on the, in the laboratory scale. But what happened was that for every one rupee of power they were putting inside the machine, the maximum they could get out of the machine was 0 0.65, 65 paisa equivalent. So the more you put and the lesser you have out. Now that is something which disturbs the whole economical scenario because you will never like to spend more money to gain something less out of it. So in, t in, the, in the fusion terms, this is what is called the Q factor. Q factor basically means that how much output power you can get for a given input power. And you have to increase this Q factor continuously so that you make it more economically viable. And this is one important aspect of the experiment which ITER is testing in the coming days. But in order to do that, you have to increase the size of the machine. So when we talk about the joint European Taurus experiment, the volume of the plasma was 80 meter cube. And we have to increase this fellow to 10 times. We are talking of a plasma which, has a, which is 830 meter cubes. Okay? But what are we gaining? See here, we put in 23 as the input heating power and we got our fusion power of 16 megawatt. This picture will reverse in the case of ITER. In the case of ITER, we will be putting only heating power of 50 megawatts. But the output power that, that, that we are hoping to achieve should be around 500 megawatt. So we have improved a Q factor from 0.65 to a Q factor of 10. And this is what is the basic thing which will drive or which will prove that fusion is actually a very good, although it's a source of energy, but it's a commercially viable source of energy. Okay? So, uh, and in order to do this, this thing, we have a plasma current of 15 mega amps, 
whereas here the plasma current is only 5 mega amps. Okay. So over the years, we started from a very small tokamak. We are going to a tokamak which, is, which has a plasma volume of almost a thousand meter cube. That's a large number. So it has taken us 70 years to reach there. It has taken us a lot of efforts to understand the behavior of the plasma. It has taken a lot of efforts to see what kind of technologies have to evolve to be able to control this plasma on the laboratory scale. And it has taken a lot of effort to understand how we can convert the Q of 0.65 to a Q of 10. And we have to demonstrate that. And this is what ITER is all about. So why do I say that? Another important aspect of technology, I mean, for the children sitting here, you might be feeling, what am I talking about? But it is to develop, to help you develop a vision, a vision for the future. I mean, you are living in a, in a golden time when power is available, when scooter cars are available, when planes are available, and you, have, you don't face the real hardships of life. But there can come a stage when two generations from you, when you, your, your grandchildren can, can, can end up in a world which is totally dark. So it's your responsibility to start thinking, to start contributing in whatever way you can. If you feel interested in the field of science and technology, you can definitely contribute to this thing so that your grandchildren enjoy much more than what you enjoy today. OK? So uh, let us, uh, j just for, for the senior audience sitting here, uh, we have, just to make you understand the numbers, so uh, let us say if uh, we want a temperature of 10 keV, that's the temperature which is most suitable for the DT reaction fusion to occur. So this temperature uh, has a certain reaction rate which is basically, which basically is the probability of an event happening per second so that the two atoms come together and fuse. So that is the reaction rate of 10 to the minus 22. And we need a plasma density, if we have a plasma density of 6 into 10 to the 19 or 110 to the 20 per meter cube. Plasma density means the number of plasma ions in a given volume. That is what density is about. Mass per unit volume. Density you read as mass per unit volume, that is what you know. So this is converting it, that mass into atoms. Okay? So this is 6, 6 into 10 to the 19 ions per meter cube, a kind of a density of plasma you have. Then you will produce a power of 1 megawatt per meter cube. So from one meter cube of this uh, enclosed environment, you can get a power which is one megawatt. Now, uh, because, so once you have created this plasma, this plasma tends to move outward, so it is generating an outward pressure. So this pressure is of the order of 0.4 megapascals. So this is, you need to compensate this pressure in some way to make the plasma or to allow the plasma to remain confined. And how do you do that? This is where the role of the magnetic field comes in, what Ravi told in the last talk, that you need magnetic fields to confine the plasma. So you're talking of magnetic fields which are of the order of 5 Tesla. And uh, so you have decided on the magnetic field. Now this magnetic field is being produced by the superconducting coils because once you start flowing current into, the, into any wire, it starts getting heated. And in order for, to allow more current to, to flow through the fire, you have to reduce the temperature. That is where the concept of superconductivity comes in. So in the present days of technology that we have, the maximum we can have is a field of about 10 to 12 Tesla. But this is 10 to 12 Tesla at the, at the superconducting cable. As we increase the distance from there, the field tends to reduce as 1 by R. So if we are talking of 5 Tesla in the center of the plasma, we actually have to have a coil which produces about 10 Tesla at the at surface. So uh, so we are at the limit of the thing. Now as, but there is a lot of work which is going on in the field of superconductivity to generate uh, superconducting coils which can um, uh, produce much higher fields than, than what we have today. And that is a very, that would be very advantageous in two ways. One is that you can reduce the size of the machine. Okay. And the other is that you can actually uh, uh, pr produce uh, um, uh, the cost of the reactor. Once you reduce the size of the machine, you have reduced the cost of the reactor itself. So, and the other advantage would be that if you have increased the field, then the fusion power goes as the fourth power of the field. So the fusion power F is proportional to the magnetic field B times raised to the power 4. So it's like 2 times 2 is 2 squared. So similarly, B times B times uh, F times F times F, F times F. Okay. So four times we have increased the fusion power. And that is very advantageous because then for a lower, smaller, in a smaller machine, for a higher field, 
you produce more power. So it, it becomes more economically viable. So for the present, what ITER is aiming at, it is aiming at a radius of 2 meters in, in the horizontal direction and 6 meters in vertical direction, the field and the currents I have already said. Now how does this idea of uh, ITER come up? So once the, 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 the capacity of, the, of, the, of fusion was realized, once the usefulness of fusion was realized, words st started thinking together, so we should pr build some reactor or a, an experimental device which we can, uh, through which we can demonstrate the power of fusion. So in the, in the Cold War days, this was President Gorbachev and Reagan who first thought about this idea in 1986 and then in 2006. So an idea which generated in 1986, it took 20 years to materialize into an agreement which became the agreement for ITER, which became the basis for ITER. So you, now ITER, because it's a very expensive experiment, what was decided was that it cannot be built by one country. So many countries decided to participate in it, India being one of them. Besides India, you have China, you have Korea, you have Russia, you have United States, you have European Union as a whole who are participating in that. And you have US as well. Yeah, I said United States. And the heads of all of these countries came together in 2006 in the French palace with uh, President Francois Mitterrand standing in the center and the, the then chairman of Department of Atomic Energy, Dr. Anil Kakotkar, representing India in this historic moment when India entered ITER. So we entered ITER in 2006. Now, uh, so I have already said that it is a multinational scientific mission which demonstrates the techn technological feasibility of fusion power to produce a burning plasma with a Q factor of 10. And it works by confining the plasma in a toroidal vacuum chamber surrounded by a lot of coils which are called the toroidal coils. Uh, uh, and But in order to raise the temperature of the plasma beyond a certain, certain value, as I taught, taught, told you about the auxiliary heating devices, we have a lot of auxiliary heating devices for this, for this system. And these auxiliary heating devices are in the form of RF sources or in the form of uh, neutral particle beams energetic neutral particle beams. So these are the auxiliary heating devices which will be used to raise the temperature of the plasma and once we have produced the fusion, then the helium 3.5 MeV from helium will self sustain the plasma and you can reduce the power from the auxiliary heating devices. So this is, this is how it is supposed to work and the confinement as I said is, sorry, uh, is done through the magnetic coils. Just to give you an idea of how much uh, what is the weight and the dimensions of this? There is a central solenoid. This one, this is the thing which starts the plasma inside the, uh, inside the machine. It is 13 meters high and its weight is 1000 tons. Okay? The coils, they are 17 meter high each. It has a set of coils here, 17 each, meter of each coil and each is weighing 360 tons. Look at the massive numbers that I am talking about and, the and then there are 6 poloidal coils which are 200 to 400 tons and with different diameters which are arranged in this direction. Now, if we were to summarize all the, all the uh, machine components together, one picture that emerges is that we are talking of very large components, very weighty components. We in technical terms call them naval construction size components, but these components have to be manufactured and fitted with a precision like a watch. So if you go to a watchmaker, you see, I mean, watch has very small, 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 small components. And you, when you put all those components together, then the watch starts working. Here we are talking of components which are in meters and weighs in tons. And we have to, from meters, we have to come down to tolerances of millimeters. And that too, not hundreds of millimeters, few millimeters. So we are talking of a big device having fitted with components which have a watch-like precision. So this is the message you take home from this. And so now the question is, why did India start participating in ITER? Of course, we have, we have realized the importance of fusion. We have a, a fusion a, a plasma program which goes on in India. So if we join ITER, we get a, access to a lot of technologies and that helps us to leapfrog in our domestic program. We do not have to learn to, learn to spin the wheel each time. We, we reach a certain level and from there we can take off. And so we save on time 
utilizing the resources from the international community to leapfrog our program into future. Then uh, it is very economical. Why is it economical? Because if we were to build ITER on our own, we would have to invest 100% of the money. In ITER, how much we are doing? We are investing only 10% of that 100%. And what is the technology we are getting? We are getting 100% of the technology. For, for, so for 10 rupees put in, we are getting knowledge which is worth 100 rupees. It's worth participating in ITER. And it is early realization of fusion technology also helps the nuclear fusion program in such certain way. So that is another advantage which we get from ITER. Now, India's participation in ITER did not come out very simple. So there was, uh, there was this, uh, this uh, the then chairman of uh, Atomic Energy Commission, Dr. Anil Gakotkar, who took upon himself uh, to, 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 to start uh, the dialogue for participating in ITER. And he wrote the first letter in 2003 uh, to this International Atomic Energy, uh, Energy Agency to allow India to participate in ITER. And finally, uh, he, what he wrote was that we are watching the recent developments in the progress of ITER and would be keen on the opportunities of participation in this as an international effort. So that was done in 2003. And finally, for, uh, uh, for high technology and space program, which was already started in India in collaboration with the US, this was a big boost. Now, there's another person who was very important to this program, and that is the ex or the founder director of Institute for Plasma Research, Professor P.K. Kao, who not only recognized or, uh, uh, that the participation in ITER is an ultimate, uh, ultimate need of the hour, but he also said that by doing this, we will not only be uh, learning the technologies of ITER, but we can use these achievements for better coatings, for cheaper light sources, for improved heat resistant material and other high technology materials. So he had a very broad vision. He is no more with us today. But it was his vision, coupled with the efforts of Anil Karkotkar, which ensured that India became a partner of ITER. <coughs> but any project that you start, there are, of course, there are, uh, there are hindrances in the project. Not hindrances, but there are unplanned things in the project, which come to light as you start moving with the project. So what happened was that at the time when we started this, when we did the signature, there were some design issues which were not fully resolved. It was not that they were overlooked upon, but it was that the technology was developing worldwide. And as we got more and more answers to the questions, we realized that some, some improvements have to be made in the design. For example, if when Fukushima came in, it, it, it said that new, if you have a plant of a nuclear standard, you need these, these, these additional safety measures to be taken in for which the design has to be revised. So it is in this sense that I say that the, some design issues were not fully resolved. Then, as I said, the safety and regulatory experts were also not very well integrated, but they became more integrated and the need for them was more felt when, when Fukushima disaster happened and the project execution bodies like ITER organization, which exists today, or the domestic agencies had not been formed by that time. So it was in, in the post-signature, all these, this important event of forming the execution bodies also started taking shape. And so this was the time at when we signed the signature. So <coughs> what happened was that after the signature came in and more and more international experts got involved, there were about 150 experts who from 2007 to 2009 did an entire detailed design review of the plans for ITER and found out that there are many outstanding issues which need to be resolved before we build, build the ITER. So uh, uh, there were a lot of changes, systematic changes which were brought into this design. And when the, uh, when the contracts were awarded, some manufacturability and meeting inter interface requirements also required changes. Because if the interface is wrong, interface simply means that if, for example, if I have this and this, so the two need to interface to form this product. So if the interfaces are wrong, then I cannot assemble the product. So these are, this is what I mean by interfaces. Some of the interfaces had to, be, had to be changed, and the Fukushima helped you to bring in more safety regulations. So, so we had, uh, so post the signature, each country had to face certain design changes. So here is the number of changes involved in the design, and here is the domestic agency, China, European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russian Federation, and the US. So this shows that the maximum number of changes went to EU, of course, because EU is contributing 50% of the total cost of ITER. So the maximum changes also went to ITER, uh, to the EU. But the thing to note here is that be, after EU, it was India who faced, faced the maximum number of design changes. Okay. 
So we had to face a lot of design changes when, once we had joined ITER and once this review took place. Uh, and there were other countries also who went. And these design changes were in the different components of the, of the machine, which is the cryostat, the cooling water machine, and stuff like that. But OK, let's forget this. But to give you an idea of the magnanimity, you see there are five stories here. So it's like a five-story building. Okay? And all of this yellow, blue, blue, red, each of them is a component. So all these levels, there are components which are spread over. So there are millions of components here. If we take all nuts, bolts, washers, everything together, there are millions of components which are spread. And we are talking of all these components have to interface well with each other to help you realize the machine. And this, when this, all these flows are put together, it's about 60 meters tall, which is half the height of Kutub Minar if you have visited Kutub Minar in Delhi. So we are talking of a very tall structure, we are talking of millions of components, and we are talking of the precision which, with which those millions of components have to be manufactured in order to ensure that we are able to assemble the machine to start the experiments. So this is the magnanimity that I keep talking about. So this is uh, what is showing you a path towards ITER. So as I said, in 2006, we signed the agreement. But uh, this is the site, how it looked like initially. It was a flat, barren ground. The, the site is in France, in south of France, in a very near to a city called Marseille. Uh, and much nearer to a historic city called Aix-en-Provence. Uh, so it's about, it's about there. And once these exca excavations started, but because of the, of the design changes that I mentioned you about, from 6 to 11 was a very lull period in terms of manufacturing. But slowly it took off, then the seismic, seismic pads came in. These are the pads which support the machine in case of an earthquake event. So these are the seismic pads which had to be put in. Then the license agreement, which is the nuclear regulatory, uh, French nuclear regulators uh, license had to be signed. Then the one slab of the building came up. Finally, the assembly building is there. So this shows the number of changes that we talked about earlier, how they were implemented over the number of years in order to ensure that we are moving in the correct path. Uh, so this is a five-year progress from 2014 to 2019. It was a barren piece of land which looked like this in 2014 because the because a start uh, I mean a delay in the start of the project because of the design changes and this in five years so many buildings so many components have come up on the site and this we are talking of 72 percent of civil works which have been completed for this in 2019. Now, uh, so the, in 2016 the entire experimental phase of the of the machine was decided uh, because of, because of the, the delays which happened in, in the earlier days. So the construction phase is supposed to end in 2025. Okay, we are in 19 today. In 25, we will finish construction of the machine and we will start the experiments. So the first plasma experiments inside the machine would start somewhere in December 25 or January 26. And this whole experimental phase from, we'll start with hydrogen, we'll start with helium experiments, move on to hydrogen, establish plasma in large size machines with 870 meter cube of plasma and then we will move on to the uh, deuterium tritium fusion phase and finally we will we'll demonstrate we try we hope we will be able to demonstrate the whole thing by 2037. The deactivation phase once these experiments are over remember this is only an experimental machine it is not a machine to produce electricity it's a machine to explain the concept and to demonstrate the concept of with a fusion power of Q10 to, to tell to the world that yes, we are ready to build a reactor which can ultimately be used for producing electricity. So this is an experimental reactor as it is called. The deactivation phase is from 37 to 42 and finally there is a decommissioning phase. But uh, you would have realized that ITER is a big uh, scientific and technological challenge. But it is something more than that. And that something more than that is the management challenge of ITER. Now management is very important. For example, if some partner, you are, you are staying in a family, okay? You are a son in the family. You have brothers, you have sisters, you have mother, you have father. Each of them has a certain responsibility. And the whole house has to be managed with, e with each partner, uh, you know, giving 100% to the responsibility you have in the family. Similar is the case of Eater. Eater is a large international family. So each member has to deliver something, okay? So that is why we call it a management uh, challenge. And that management challenge was embodied in it from the very incipient stage or from the stage when ITER was real, was the thoughts of ITER were realized. So nothing, uh, I mean, this may not interest you, but as I have said that we are, each partner 
ex other than the EU is contributing on only one eleventh of it, and the contributions are not in majorly in terms of money. The contributions are majorly in terms of the components that we supply for the machine. And broad, in broad categories, the components are buildings, heatings, diagnostic control, external inter auxiliaries, internal auxiliaries, and the machine core. So here is India. So it is participating in all of these, but with a certain fraction. EU has the maximum for all of them. <coughs> now, once the ITER organization was fo followed, like it is said that, okay, the, the parents in the family have this responsibility, the children have this responsibility. Similarly, is the role of EO, IO, IO is the ITER organization. It gives you the designs and specifications. It monitors the technical progress, quality and schedule, like parents monitor whether you are studying or not. And then integration, commissioning, operation and decommissioning. Okay. And then the role of DA is, okay, once it has been decided that which, which country would make what, the role of the DA or the domestic agency, like India is a domestic agency, it has to deliver the role of what has been promised to ITER. And it has to deliver the role with a lot of documentation and technical support and monitors or sub monitoring of supplying, suppliers' progress. So it's, a, it's one project. It has seven agencies, hundreds of work packages. Work packages are nothing but the components that have to be made. There are thousands of contractors who are making these components, and there are millions of components which are being made. And in order to complete this cycle, every domestic agency for every major system they are making, they give, go from a phase of design to development to prototyping to testing to manufacturing to testing again, bringing it to the acceptance of ITER, finally integrating with the machine, commission it, and then operate the machine by 2025. So, uh, we are progressing at the at a rate which is 0.7 percent per month, and we hope to. So this is how the the site looks like today. Okay. Uh, just to show you, this is the main machine or the tokamak, and surrounding this main machine are hundreds of other other buildings. For example, this is the place where this is are the buildings which are dedicated to magnets. This is the electrical supply uh, area. Then this is the cryostat workshop. In fact, there are components which are very big in size. Cryostat, in fact, I say because cryostat is being manufactured in India, is being supplied by India. It's a, as I said, it is 30 meters high, 30 meters wide, and it is a jacket of the machine. The first component that you see if you look into the machine, okay? And it is one of the biggest vacuum vessels India has ever, or the world has ever produced. So it's an it's a engineering marvel, and we should be proud that we are, uh, we are a part of that. Another important aspect is the in-wall shields. Mr. Money, who is heading the uh, of Sarala Technologies today, uh, he is the person who is responsible for supplying these in-vessel shields to the to the to ITER. So you see that you have a man right in the audience who is who is contributing big time to ITER. And there are many other uh, partners, industry partners we have who are supplying different components to the machine. <coughs> so you can say that just to tell you that cryolines is another important area which India is participating in. Then there are correction coils which are being made in China. Thermal shields are being made in Korea. Uh, and the, uh, the poloidal field coils are being made in Russia. Then the torus, tor toroidal field coils are made by Korea. You can see the size of the coil. And there's a large group of people sitting here who are just looking like ants. So the size is the, is the magnanimity, is, this, is wall eater, what eater is all about. Then there are neutral accelerated neutral beams, part of, one of which is being supplied by India as well. And there's the central solenoid, which is be being made in US. So you can see each of these partners, each of these partners is making one or the other big components for ITER. <coughs> so what is beyond ITER? Beyond ITER is, so while, while, we wait to, while we wait for ITER to generate results, we must keep ourselves ready by carrying out various technology development products, which are for the demo design. Demo design is the next stage of ITER, where we hope that if ITER experiment is a success experiment. We utilize this demo reactor to produce electricity for consumption for the for the masses. So, um, the, of course, as we are going through the years, the technology is evolving, the the components are evolving, and as I said, if I if we do a lot of uh, research in the superconducting area and bring come out with coils which can produce higher magnetic fields, we can make it more compact. So, it, it is possible that whatever we envision for demo. Uh, may become a, uh, a different machine tomorrow because of the evolving technologies, but at least we are working not, uh, not only to demonstrate fusion on one hand, but also to, on the technology front, 
to see where fusion can be made more and more cheaper. So this is where Beyond Eater is. And if, if, you, if you just look at, so what, what Eater does is that every four months, it sends this drone in the sky to, you know, to photograph how the site progress is going on. So if you want to see this site. ITER will be the world's largest experimental facility to demonstrate the scientific and technical feasibility of fusion power. 30 meters in diameter and nearly as many in height, the ITER tokamak will house a large number of subsystems and components. The size and weight of the major components, the tiny tolerances for the assembly of major systems, the diversity of manufacturers, the tight schedule, all of these elements combine to make ITER an engineering and logistics challenge of enormous proportions. The principal assembly activities will be performed in the Tokamak building, where the ITER device will be installed inside of a partially embedded concrete bioshield. For the duration of assembly activities, the Tokamak building will be operated as a clean area and maintained at a constant temperature to avoid dimensional changes in the largest components. Pre-assembly activities will take place in the adjacent assembly hall. Assembly of the ITER tokamak will proceed in a bottom-up fashion. First, the lower feeders for the ITER magnets will be put in place.
Then, the base of the cryostat, the largest single component of the ITER machine, is lifted into position. The next components assembled are the lower cylinder of the cryostat, thermal shields, and the temporary support structures for poloidal field coil number six, the smallest of the set of six. A set of spare pre-compression rings are the next in line, together with the central support structure and the 18 gravity supports for ETA's huge toroidal field coils. Thermal shields that will protect the steel support structure are then attached. And finally, poloidal field coil number six is lowered into the pit, followed by PF coil number five. In order to prepare for the arrival of the pre-assembled vessel sectors, the inner support column, the work floor, and the seven beams are put in place to stabilize the structure during the assembly phase. While the cryostat is being assembled in the Tokamak Hall, parallel activity is in full swing in the assembly hall. It's here where the sub-assembly of the nine 40-degree sectors is being prepared. Each set made up of a vacuum vessel sector, the surrounding thermal shields, and two toroidal field coils. In order to successfully maneuver hundreds of very large tokamak components into position, a very precise made-to-order set of tools is currently under construction. A special sub-assembly tool will suspend each of the nine sectors of the vacuum vessel from its top, install associated thermal shielding, and rotate two toroidal field coils into position. This procedure will be repeated consecutively to achieve nine sub-assemblies, which will be transferred into the tokamak pit for the final sector assembly. The lifting system will be comprised of a pair of independent bridge cranes mounted on rails that run the entire length of the tokamak and assembly halls to form a continuous 175 meter long crane bay. Working together, the four 375 ton main hoists will handle loads of up to 1,500 tons. With more than 18 meters height, the central solenoid, the magnet in the center of the machine, will be the tallest lift of assembly operations. The heaviest single load will be the base of the cryostat, which weighs in at 1,200 tons. In some cases, components standing 20 meters high and weighing hundreds of tons will have to be maneuvered into position within tolerances of two to three millimeters. The accurate alignment of the tokamak components, particularly of the magnet system and in-vessel components, is essential to the successful operation of the machine. Assembly sequences have been planned with this in mind and will utilize sophisticated optical metrology techniques at each step of the assembly process. In all, 161 different types of custom tools will be required to assemble, lift, and finally maneuver ETA's supersized components. The tools will have loading capacities that vary from 500 tons for the upending tool that will turn vacuum vessel components from horizontal to vertical to 1,500 tons for the heavy lifting tools used to lift the sub-assembled sectors into the tokamak pit for final assembly and welding. There, the largest purpose-built tool, the in-pit assembly tool, will grasp all nine sectors together, 3,800 tons, in order to align the vessel structure. The complete assembly of the ETA machine will take about four years. Following main assembly and alignment of the vacuum vessel, the second assembly phase, the installation of in-vessel components, will proceed with specialized remote handling devices. Okay, so you have seen very important aspects. One is, as I said, ITER is big. Other is it is technologically complex. But for you young kids, 
the thing that you should take from this video is the logical thinking that is required to solve any problem. Whenever you attempt a problem small or big, the first thing you have to see is what the problem is. The second thing you have to start thinking how to get over the problem. What are the tools I will require from the problem? And the sequence I have to attempt the problem to be able to solve the problem. So this video is a very good demonstration. I mean, like you make puzzles. Whenever you start making a puzzle, you have different pieces. But you go on adding piece by piece, seeing that, OK, this color matches with that. This shape matches with that. That's how you solve the puzzle. When you go to big engineering projects, it is again solving a puzzle on a much b bigger platform because you have developed also. But you should never be, th you should never think in your life, oh, this is too difficult, I can't do it. You know, we should always have the positive aspect. I can do everything because my mind is to, trained to do everything. So as you grow, you have responsibilities towards the society. You have responsibilities in terms of science and technology. You have responsibility to contribute to the, to the, to the mankind so that the generations in future, you know, they are able to enjoy much better than what we are today. So with these words, I, I finish. And I thank you all for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. Yeah.